All right, I don't know how to uh, introduce this next guy. When, when you look at his bio and you see him being the first hit on steel cage knife fight search on Google, that's not actually true. You're the entire first page of Result. steel cage knife fight. So uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, details are probably going to be pretty interesting. Uh, Simon and I share a reputation uh, for uh, liver issues, I think, would be the, the way, uh, an affection for beer, a really, really deep affection uh, for beer and technology. And I, I don't know if the beer was probably all consumed last night, uh, but the technology we have today, Simon Stewart. Um, great. So, um, building a test grid for the cloud. Greetings, everybody. I'm Simon Stewart. Um, I work at Google as an SET. Um, in particular, I work on the browser automation team, um, where I am one of the tech leads. Um, I think Ted uh, is also here. He's sitting over there. He's one of the other ones as well. Um, what, do we, what does a browser automation team do? Well, it's a team that automates web browsers. Um, <laughs> In, in particular, uh, we contribute quite a lot to the Selenium project. Um, I'm the creator of WebDriver as well. Um, and that forms a sort of key part of our infrastructure. And what I'm going to be doing is telling you how we've built out our infrastructure from um, the individual user running on their machine to the uh, massively parallel system we have right now, how you can do that yourself, and why you might not want to. So um, the important thing to bear in mind as I go through all of this is that although some of the ideas and some of the concepts might seem very odd or like, hey, there's no way we could ever do that, like we're not Google, we don't have the infrastructure, we can't do this, um, actually you can. It's, it, it's not that bad. Um, well, I say it's not that bad. It's been horrific getting here. Um, but there are some sort of fundamental steps at a really high level that you could imagine taking. Now, the first step is you need to be able to write tests. The second step is once you've got those tests written, you need to be able to, to, to make sure they're isolated from each other. And then once you've done that, you can head to the cloud um, and achieve complete victory uh, in your testing. So um, why, in the name of all that's holy, do we want to head to the cloud? Oh, by the way, you may have noticed there's lots of snails on the slides. Um, the reason why I think we should head to the cloud is for speed. And when I was looking for a picture to, 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 to use in this slide, I found a picture of a snail, and I thought, ah, OK, that's fine. So I think that's a very handsome snail. Um, so like, one of the problems we have in this industry is that everyone makes up their own definition for, for different phrases. Like, I reckon if I asked like a dozen people in the audience um, what their definition of the word cloud was, you'd come up with some fairly different definitions. Um, I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to come up with my own definition. Um, the, cheat, the, the, the cloud is there to help you achieve scale. And what we want to do, we care about scale because if we can scale out big enough, we can, we can tighten the feedback loops. We can provide information to our development teams and our test teams, and we can release products faster. So as far as I'm concerned, the reason why you want to head to the cloud is so that you can take your application, you can deliver it quickly, and you can delight your customers sooner with fewer defects. Sounds pretty cool. Sounds pretty nice. That's why you want to do it. So you know in that little recap, the very first thing was write the tests. Who's responsible for writing test cases? Um, who here works in a team where the developers just crank out code and the testers, the QA team, are responsible for ensuring that everything works properly. OK. Got some news for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> How many of you work in a company where the testers outnumber the developers? <laughs> As if that's ever going to happen. So let me get this straight. There are people in this room where, who are outnumbered by the developers, and yet they're expected to test everything that these developers crank out. And writing code is a fairly quick operation. 
you know, especially if I don't have to prove that it works. <laughs> like, <laughs> the maths just doesn't work. The people who need to write tests are developers, or they need to be empowered to write tests. And that brings some really interesting constraints in to what your test system can be. Um, developers, there tend to be hordes of them, right? You know, they swarm all over the place like, like some sort of insect plague. <laughs> Given this, we can't really afford expensive licenses for tools for all of them, particularly if we want them to own their own testing, right? So those, those expensive commercial tools with the license which are like 10,000 pounds a seat, that's not a good fit for a world where we want developers to be writing tests. Now, the other thing as well is that developers are a, a very picky bunch, um, and they don't like changing tools very often uh, unless they've picked it themselves, in which case they'll change tools at the drop of a hat. Um, and, and they're wedded to their IDEs. You know, it might be Vi, it might be Emacs, poor souls. Um, it might be IntelliJ, Eclipse, Visual Studio, it might be Slick Edit, it might be TextMac, whatever it is, but they love their text editors with the, the, the fancy IDE stuff around it. And that means that any testing tool that we use has to be able to integrate with that text-based environment that they have. It needs to be, have an API, an application programming interface, that they can use. So you want a test tool that writes in code, and that means that you can store it under source control, which means that you can do all these things. Um, I'm a big fan of WebDriver for exactly this reason. Like, I want my developers to be empowered and able to write tests themselves because they outnumber me. At Google, I think the ratio of, of SWE, software engineer, to SET, software engineering test, which is what I am, seven to one. And that ratio is getting worse at the moment. Um, we need the developers to, to pull their weight. And, you know, since they're doing that, they can build the abstractions. And once developers, and developers are really good at building abstractions, all right? And once they've done that, well, they should be. If they're not, find some new developers. <laughs> or find a new company. Um, once they've built these abstractions, there's no reason why you can't repurpose those, those particular abstractions they've built for your tests as well. So maybe they'll do TDD, maybe they'll do this thing, and then you can come along and go, by the way, here, I'm a tester, I, I understand how, how apps should work, and I found a bunch of bugs, so I'm gonna write some regression tests, we'll fix it. Build on top of their, of their infrastructure. So um, back in the day, um, quite a lot of people are here now uh, when they're building their test grid out. Um, that's running tests on their local developer workstation. How many of you do that? Almost no one. Oh, wow. Um, so uh, what tends to happen here is you fire up Selenium, the Selenium server. Um, you fire up WebDriver. You uh, use whatever browser happens to be on your local machine. And you write your tests, and, and it's kind of fun. And then you run into a problem, and you go, hey, Jim. Because presumably one of your developers is called Jim. Um, or you just point at someone, Jim. <laughs> Test is failing. And so he goes, hang on, let me check out the code, because it's all under source control. And he checks out the code, and he runs it, and he goes, it works fine on my machine. <laughs> and this is one of the problems you get, right? You've got these tests running on your machine, um, and your environment may be slightly different from theirs. You might be using Ma a Mac, they may be using Windows. Um, you may both be on Windows, you may both be on a Mac, but you might have different versions of Firefox. Um, maybe he's got that whiz-bang extension installed that pre prevents any tool from working on his machine. Um, maybe you do. Um, that's kind of sucky. The other problem that you have is that your machine, even if it's a pretty pokey one, is underpowered. An end-to-end -end test takes a long time to run, yeah? I mean, you know, a unit test around a single piece of code, that might take as many as, as, as 10 milliseconds to run. Has anyone got an end-to-end -end test that runs in 10 milliseconds? <laughs> if you do, come and see me afterwards. We may have a job for you. Um, so given that we can't make the tests themselves go faster, if we run 50 tests that each take, say, 30 seconds, we're going to have to wait a really long time for the test to complete. And no one's going to do that. I know I'm not. 
the way to avoid that is you need to be able to start running a test in parallel. Maybe you're still on your own machine at this point, but if you could run, say, four tests at the same time, then you can, you know, slash the, the, the length of time of your test suite down to a quarter of what it used to be. And that's actually quite a substantial saving. And that's really, really cool. But it introduces problems. Um, you may tend to drink as you solve these problems. It's <laughs> deeply frustrating. We still don't get this right all the time at Google. Um, but there are things you can do to help reduce the pain of running tests in parallel. Running tests in serial, you can modify the state of the system. And maybe one test here modifies the state in one way. Five minutes later, another test comes along. And you think it's running against a clean system, but it's running against the system that was modified over here. Damn it. When you run those tests in a different order, or maybe like because you're now running them in parallel, things start failing. And you'll get really weird errors out of the system. And you'll run the test, and it's like, well, run on, when I run it on its own, it's fine. When I run it as part of the grid, uh, I run it in a parallel run, uh, it fails at like one time in 10. There are a few things you can do to reduce this. Um, we're talking about data isolation here, right? So if you can, generate the data that your test depends on in the test itself, or do it as close as you can to that test. Don't rely on like being able to nuke the database before every single test run, because that's a surefire way of making your life really quite uncomfortable. So you've got test, uh, data isolation. Um, you're setting things up. Um, randomize the order of your tests. You know, you don't even need to be running in parallel to start doing this. And you'll start finding all the places where you're starting to break test isolation. That's kind of fun. The other thing that happens is there are limited resources of certain kinds, like user accounts are a classic example. Um, and what happens is if you have 50 tests running and four of them have logged in as the same user, they're all going to see changes that the other tests are making to, 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 to the screens, right? And that's going to introduce new sources of instability and what I like to refer to as fun. You can, you can avoid this in one of two ways. One way, just create more of the shared resource um, and you know, make enough for the one per test. The other way of doing it is to lock these shared resources and hand them out. So if you've only got four accounts, then you can probably only run four, four tests at the same time. The other thing you can do is you can test the change in the application state rather than absolutes. So when, if you're writing a, a, an email system, for example, and you go, when I delete an email, there should be, and I've got one email in the, in the account, uh, and I delete an email, I should have no emails in the account. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. But when you're running in parallel, maybe you've got other tests creating and sending emails to the same account. You've got these shared resources. The test itself should probably read something like, given I have an email with this subject and it looks like this, and I delete it, I can no longer find that email in the system. That's a more robust test in the face of changing, changing state in the system. And that's the sort of thing that you need to be able to do. Test the delta in the application rather than the absolutes that are, are hold when you're on your local machine. So you've now managed to achieve um, parallel test running uh, on your local workstation. It's time to scale out. At Google, we built a system called the Selenium Farm. Um, Jennifer Bevan gave a talk about this at LTech, the very first GTEC back in the day. Um, and Philip Haringo uh, from ThoughtWorks wrote a system called Selenium Grid, which does basically the same thing. The Selenium Farm was, was various rooms stuck around the campus of of shared, shared computers um, running all esoteric manner of, of, of browsers. So suddenly, like we develop on Linux most of the time at Google, and suddenly we were able to say to people, hey, if you want to test with Internet Explorer, that's now a possibility. If you want to test with Safari on a Mac, that's now a possibility. So we started being able to offer more, more types of browsers to people, um, and that caught new and interesting problems, because it turns out, uh, unbelievably, that different browsers do things in different ways. I know, it's hard to believe. Um, and that's kind of fun, yeah? You know, you can suddenly start doing this. You've got this shared resource, um, and, and it's all tickety-boo. Um, but there are problems. There are always problems. It's a shared resource, right? It's possible for some greedy soul to 
use up all of that shared resource um, on their own. You know, suddenly being able to run 50 tests in parallel, you've got 20 teams running 50 tests in parallel. Your, your infrastructure isn't set up for that. Worse, it's a shared resource that you need to maintain, right? You know, uh, with Selenium 1, if an alert popped up at the wrong time, that would lock that particular session. Um, and so what would happen is you'd have denial of services. And so you'd need to do sort of clever tricks like reboot the machines every n minutes. And, you know, if a, test, if a machine doesn't do a heartbeat every five minutes, then maybe you tear it down and you pull it back up. And that will cause tests to fail in a sort of slightly inexplicable way because it's being used by everyone. Um, that's not good. The other thing as well is that maintaining this pool of machines, that's actually quite an intensive process. You need an admin to look after all this kit. Yeah? You know, you need to pay someone to make sure the images are kept up to date, that, you know, the, the machines are happy, and it's all good. Um, if you're anything like, like, like I would do, I would probably just start building this thing out in a cupboard somewhere. Um, we actually had a, had a test recently to see what would happen. They uh, powered down the machine, uh, one, of the, one of the rooms, and it, it didn't come up again. Crap. Ah. That's not good, yeah? You hear stories of, like, cleaners coming in and pulling out the, the power cables so they can hoover in the room, um, and that brings down your test infrastructure. Uh, you probably don't want that to happen. But there are ways to address these problems. It's spinal tap. Um, it's, it's really, really faint, but if you look, the rating goes all the way up to 11. <laughs> I love IMDb. Um, but you can address these problems. One way that we addressed the machines locking was to reboot them periodically. Well, how many times should we reboot them? Should it be once every 20 minutes? Once every 10 minutes? Once every five minutes? What about after every single test? So anytime anyone wants a browser, we give them a new machine with a clean browser in a known state, and when they finish using that browser, we just nuke the machine. And that kind of implies virtual machines, right? But virtual machines take a really long time to start up. Has anyone like, got a VM on their, on their laptop? And have they tried doing work in that VM? Yeah, exactly. But there are, th there are things you can do to make that less painful. Like you can take snapshots. And a VM image that would take two or three minutes to start up would take about 30 seconds, 20 seconds maybe. If you've got an SSD, it might appear to be almost instant. Well, I say almost instant. Um, so you can crank that dial up. And it's a shared resource, right? But at Google, we've got this fantastic build system. You may have been reading about it on, our, on, our, on the Google testing blog. Um, and we can, we can spread out to a vast build grid. Effectively, we treat it as being infinite in size. It's actually five machines under my desk. <laughs> so you've got a build grid of infinite size. Why don't we just? start virtual machines on that build grid of infinite size. And that means that rather than having a shared resource, you run the VM wherever the test is, and that's super fast, yeah? So you can parallelize your test. You can shove them onto this grid of infinite size, um, and you start a VM whenever the test requests a browser, and you're done, right? That's easy. We've already solved the test isolation problems. Sorry. We've already solved the test isolation problems. We've already figured out how to lock shared resources. Um, our tests now run in parallel. Um, and the longest that they take is the length of the longest test. It's kind of fun. At Google, we do this. Uh, we run over a million web tests a day this way. It's quite a few. Now, I said that you could build your own. And I wasn't lying. Um, Selenium 2 now comes with Selenium Grid 2, um, again, written by a Frenchman, uh, Francois Reynard, who works at eBay. Um, Selenium Grid 2 has the ability to uh, start up a virtual machine on demand. Like, we don't ship it with that, but it's a, it's a plug-in. And the reason why we don't ship it with that is because there are so many virtualization systems. You know, there's um, the KVM modules for Linux, uh, 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 VirtualBox, there we go, that was the one I was looking for. Um, VMware, uh, and you know, little solutions that everyone's working on, QMU Box, things like that. Um, so you can take the Selenium Grid idea. You can take Selenium Grid, um, and then all you need is a grid of infinite size. 
Has anyone got one of those? <laughs> well, it turns out you all do. Um, Amazon have been very, very patient um, and built EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud. So you can go out onto EC2, you can bring up the machines on demand, you can install the browsers that you want on there, and away you go, you know, particularly if you're testing on Linux. Um, so if you're willing to accept uh, the startup time of EC2, which is 15 minutes a, a machine sometimes, you end up with quite a healthy period of, of sitting around. Um, then you can scale out to an infinite amount of size. And if your test runs take more than half an hour, actually, that's probably a really, really good choice. So there you are. You're an EC2. It's all good. Um, except, actually, that 15-minute start time is really tedious. And you'd like to test on more versions of uh, Windows Internet Explorer um, than you've got available on, on whatever it is. I think it's Server 2008 they've got running on EC2, isn't it? Someone correct me if I'm wrong. No one's correcting me. I'm right. Kevin will correct me now. I beg your pardon? 2003 or 2008. Okay. So you can't do IE9, for example. You can do IE9. Wow, I should use this stuff more often. Uh, yeah, so, but there are these browsers that, you know, you want to be able to test. Maybe you want to test, like, IE10 beta. That's not there, right? Good. Um, uh, or you want to try a really antiquated browser, like IE6 or Firefox 3.6. Um, so, you know, you, you got this. Damn it. Now, we heard earlier about, like, platforms as a service and testing as a service and stuff like that. There are companies out there who have figured out that it would be really nice to be able to run your tests in parallel on the cloud. Um, and so that's what they do. Um, have, has anyone heard of Source Labs? Yeah, a few people. So Source Labs are a company that offers Selenium testing in the cloud. They offer uh, WebDriver support, Selenium 2. Um, since the next version of Water is based on Selenium 2, you can test your Water apps in the cloud. You can test your your Selenium tests in the cloud, you, you know, you can do this. Um, and they give really fast provisioning time because that's all they do. And because that's all they do, they can achieve efficiencies of scale. It can actually work out to be cheaper than going onto EC2 yourself because, you know, you've got to start up the instances. By the way, micro instances on EC2, probably too small for doing proper web testing. You introduce some uh, new and interesting problems with that um, because you put the internet in the way of your tests. So, in fact, you put more than one internet in the way of your tests. So you test here, and that's cool. Um, and you're testing on the local, on local host, so that's nice and fine. And then you, you test to the app server that's running inside your, your, your corporate LAN, and that's nice and fast. And then you move out to, to, to the cloud, and suddenly you go test here with a remarkably chatty protocol. You go, I'm going to connect over the internet to a machine in the cloud. The cloud goes, ha-ha, excellent, connects back over the internet, over a VPN, to the server on the LAN, goes, brilliant, gets a page, filters it all the way back, goes, hey, I've got it, sends a response back to, um, to, the, to the test. You put four internets in the way. Can you imagine what that does to latency? I can tell you, it murders it. It's really not fun at all. Um, the other problem that people have is like, um, and we, we get this in bug reports on Selenium all the time. You go, people go, I've got a problem. And you go, brilliant, I'll help you fix it. Show me what your problem is. And they go, I can't do that. And you go, why not? And it's, it's my super secret application, and it only runs internally. And it's like, what is it? It's like, time and expenses app. Are you sure that's a super secret? <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. Um, when, we, when we were testing Wave internally at Google, like, they didn't want to make use of the Selenium farm because you can take snapshots of the Selenium farm. And we were trying to keep it secret from various people. And uh, if, because it was a shared resource, you know, if you took a snapshot at the right time, you might actually find out what Wave was. So they had to build out some of their own infrastructure. There are people who are nervous about these things. If you're one of those people who's nervous about those machines, those things, you need to find a room filled with machines, set up the virtual machines and use Selenium Grid 2 yourself, but yeah, probably not. It's okay to go out into the cloud. It's there. So to recap, 
write tests. I mean, I'm in the right place to say this. Um, but get your developers to write the tests as well. There are trade-offs that need to be made here. You, um, you're going to need to relinquish total control, but they're going to write all the abstractions for you. So you're going to have a whale of a time just piecing the things together like Lego. You can do that using Selenium WebDriver. Um, I'm, I could say this, I'm enormously biased. Ensure test isolation. So there are strategies to do that. Randomize the test ordering. Lock shared resources, user accounts, um, important pieces of data, things like that, um, and parcel them out and block tests from running until those shared resources become available if access to the shared resources, multiple access to shared resource, is going to cause trouble. Test the delta. For God's sake, stop testing absolute things, yeah? That, that's a recipe for disaster. And the worst thing is developers do this all the time because they only run the tests on their own machine. Oh, yeah, of course, like, there's one email there. Delete it, it's gone. Oh, of course, there's 1,000 pounds in that account, and now there's nothing. And I've got a third account where I've got all the, the spare change. Once you've done that, you're in a position to take your existing tests and head to the cloud. If you want to, you could set up Selenium 2, the grid, on a local network. Um, Kevin Menard at the back there, he's one of the maintainers of it as well. Um, you know, it's a fantastic piece of software. It's used by a lot of people. Um, it's really good if you want to have low latency and, and go fast. It's not really good uh, if you don't want to have to maintain stuff. Use virtual machines. Like, pulling up a real machine is, is, is a pain in the backside. It takes a long time. Um, and people leave things like cookies around, and the state of the machine is, is not necessarily known. If you're using a virtual machine, you can always start from a known, clean state. And the nice thing is that you could take that virtual machine image, you could copy it onto your local workstation, and you could run it there if you have any problems. That's kind of fun. If you're comfortable with running things out in the open and your time and expenses app isn't super secret and you're okay with the latency, and actually, it may not murder, it may not be that bad for you. Like, try it first. Um, heading out to something like EC2 and maintaining your own infrastructure or finding a company that already maintains that infrastructure. Um, can offer you a really nice way of scaling out onto the cloud and doing interesting things. And finally, the reason why we're doing all this, all this work, is so that we can tighten the feedback loops. We want to know at the, the shortest period of time from making a change in our code base to verifying that we haven't totally destroyed the application. Yeah? Use continuous integration. All these pieces fit really nicely into a continuous build environment like Jenkins, um, Bamboo, Team City, whatever it is that, that floats your boat. OK? Make sense? Thank you very much. <laughs> is that really the time? It is. We're early. Isn't that Wow, awesome? I rumped through that. Lots of I lots can answer questions. questions. I think we have a world record here of you're, you're always the first person with the hand up. <laughs> I like that. I'm just close to the scene, you know. Uh, <laughs> Simon, thanks a lot. Very interesting topic. Amazing talk. So uh, when, you, when talking about uh, starting virtual machines on demand, uh, yeah. so it takes like quite a, quite a bit of time. So like start picking a snapshot, starting the machine, setting it up in the way you need to set it. Like for Windows, it takes usually more time like to get to a domain and stuff like that. Have you ever tried solving this by planning what machines you might need and starting them up in front before you actually need them for, to run your tests? Like, have you tried any strategies to make it work? Sure. So um, the early versions of the Selenium farm worked in exactly that way. Sort of there'd be this pool of machines sitting there, um, and we'd fire up a VM. And then it would be ready and waiting when someone came along. Um, and that's fine until you hit bottlenecks. Like the minute you run, you run more tests and you have virtual machines, you're back to that state where you need to you know, wait for a new virtual machine to, to sort itself out. Or you're in a world where you're going to have to reuse those things. Mm -hmm. right? And that's why you need a grid of infinite size. You know, I, I jest about it, but actually, sort of the bottleneck is really, how do we provide these machines fast enough? There are things you can do to make provisioning a virtual machine a lot faster. One of them is, if you're still on rotating media, if you're not on an SSD, then a virtual machine per spindle is a really good idea. Yeah? Um, and the reason for that 
is uh, because starting one of these things is basically an exercise in I.O. You know, um, if you've got a nice fast I.O. And there was talk of SANS earlier. Like if you can pull, if, you, if, you've got, if you're fantastically wealthy, um, you can store a virtual machine on a SAN and it will be there in a, in a second. Um, other things you can do, like it's one of the problems is the amount of data that needs to be read off the disk, yeah? So you can do things like compress the machine image before you start so it loads faster. Um, and then you turn it from an I.O. problem to a CPU problem. And CPUs tend to be faster than disks, as a rule of thumb. I mean, it's, it's not always true. Um, you know, if you can trim the amount of memory that these virtual machine images have down to the minimum that you need, then that's cool. If you remove all the, all the extraneous software that you don't need, then that will also reduce the size of the machine image. Um, and yeah, so, and that's what you want to do. You want to try and load the minimum amount of data as quickly as possible. So cheat. Yeah, so, so you, you're basically trying to solve this by minimizing the time machine takes to start rather than planning up in front because that probably doesn't work in, in like conditions where your resources are limited. And your yeah. resources are usually limited, even if with Amazon, you like if you've got like 50 types of virtual machines you might use, uh, like having 10 times 50 running just in case you need them is fairly expensive in Amazon. Yeah, and, and so you're making the trade-off here with um, the initial cost of bring, bringing up, getting a, a virtual machine image, um, and then you know, being able to, to, to minimize the cost to in, in terms of dollar spend mm -hmm. in doing that. Um, the other thing as well that's kind of interesting is that you want to have a roughly consistent period of time for the build, that the build takes. Because you know, one of the really, really early warning signs that you see on a test, uh, on a failing test, is that suddenly the build is taking three times as long as it should. Have you guys seen that? Yeah. So um, if your test runtime is wildly variable, because you know, most of the time you can supply an image, but sometimes you need to spend 15 minutes pulling up a machine, then it makes it quite hard to do that sort of seat of the pants. Ah, oh, look, I know this test is failing. It's exhibiting all the problems um, that these things do. Uh, so I think I would prefer to take the hit on machine startup time because it provides a more consistent environment, and I'm a sucker for consistency. Does that make sense? Yeah. So just one thing I, that's on my mind, like for if you've got continuous integration and you've got like specific set of tests that require some specific set of machines, you, if you've got daily builds, you you can launch the machines like 10 minutes before the daily build. If you've got like uh, build on demand, not I mean built on push. Uh, like you can actually just start the machines as push push takes place, so that when 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 the environment is built, you've got the machines ready. So yeah, I, there are optimizations that you can make. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, optimization is important. Yeah, I'm not opposing it. Just thinking about like approaching the problem from like several ways. But like um, you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. I'd wait until I'd actually measured a problem before I started like starting up virtual machines. It seems like a really good idea. I can't see why, why it would be a problem. And that's exactly why it would be a problem. Okay. Because you know, any time you go, hey, look, there's never going to be any problems with this, that is the femtosecond that that thing becomes a problem. Fair enough. Cool. Thank you. Hey, Simon. Uh, just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how Google actually runs the test. I'm, do you guys run a million tests in parallel? What kind of test runner do you use? Okay. How do you break that down? And also, um, test reporting. How do you report the results, screenshots, logs, video, stuff like that? OK. Um, not, not counting the five machines under your desk. Yeah, oh, excluding those. <laughs> Damn it. Well, then we don't run any tests. Um, <laughs> So um, that, that's a little bit about like, the, the Google code base and the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that we've got. The Google code base is, um, on the whole, a single tree with all the projects tucked away under that tree. And we use four main languages. Those languages are C and C++ for sort of the low-level systems programming, Python for scripting, JavaScript on the client, and Java for everything else. Um, so you've got these things. Um, obviously, we've got end developers banging away on this code base. Um, we see about 50% of the lines, of, co lines of, of code change every month. Um, and at peak times, we're getting about 20 check-ins per minute. Um, that's globally. Uh, obviously, 
A bulk of them, the, the developers, are sort of here in Mountain View, and there's also a group in Zurich. So you see daily spikes of activity. Um, we tend to use whatever the, the um, test framework is that's most common to run the tests themselves. So uh, Java, JUnit's very popular. Um, David Saff, who's one of the contributors who's managing the releases, works at Google. Um, you know, on Python, I think we use PyTest. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, we open sourced the testing framework that we use for, for C and C++. And um, if you look up GUnit, that's what we use. Um, and then JavaScript, it's a little bit more open to debate. Uh, JS unit's pretty common. We also open sourced uh, a, a, a JavaScript library called Clojure, with an S, not a J, for you Java people. Um, a library called Clojure, and that's got its own test runner. Um, and that runs in, in the browser. So I mean, that's the basic stuff. Uh, in terms of presenting the, res the, the results, I think it's pretty common that a, a continuous build system can pick up the results and display them in a way that, that people can read them. I can't remember whether or not we've made our particular thing open uh, available and uh, people are aware of it. Um, so I'm just going to do a really hand-wavy answer. Um, but yes, we've got a, a central resource uh, hooked into our, uh, into our testing infrastructure, which allows us to view the results of tests. Um, obviously, we can keep artifacts from those tests. Uh, and I'll, I'll just do the hand wavy thing. I know that Source Labs, for example, do a really good job of presenting logs and videos and snapshots um, you know, on, on their commercial sort of infrastructure. Not an advert, but sort of I know that there are systems out there that, that provide that as well. And I guess if you're hooking into something like Jenkins or a continuous build server, if you store snapshots in a well-known location, that's cool. Um, and I know that it's possible to, to record video from XVNC. So you can save a flash video, like uh, uh, VNC to SWF or whatever followed after it can be used to, for taking videos. Does that answer the question? Wait, wait. It's like Do we run into, into any limitations into massively parallel? parallel <laughs> Sorry, just like mass, like if you're trying to massively parallelize test runs, yes. do you hit like, OK, so you have the grid running. That's awesome. Uh, but do you hit other like bottlenecks as far as the actual test runner like running these? Or do you break them up into logical areas or kind of how you get around that? Uh, I'll do a hand wavy answer again. Um, or, or you could do a sales pitch for how Google tests software, because that's explained it in, in detail in the book. My, my friend and your, colleague. It's your choice. Totally your choice. OK, my, my, my friend and colleague, the octomum of test book publishing, James Whitaker, uh, has a book that will be out at some point in the distant future <laughs> that describes all this. Um, assuming you haven't got your time machine with you, um, yes, there are problems that you run into. Um, you know, if you take a look at the open source develop, uh, mailing list of, of Selenium, you'll see that Christian Rosenwald has spent his, he seems to have a hobby, right? He's got the biggest machine known to man with like a gajillion cores and more RAM than, than he knows what to do with. And he just seems to find threading issues and fix them and make applications provably correct. Like, he's, he's a genius. Um, but those threading issues only seem to occur when you're running at high load. Yeah, so one of the problems is when you're running at high load, you're going to see new and interesting performance things that happen. One of the other things is that a high load, you know, if you're running one test at a time, your server's probably going to be OK. If you're running 50 tests at a time and you're hitting a central server, that's not only doing an end-to-end -end test, that's also a stress test for that particular piece of infrastructure. Um, and so it's pretty easy to imagine sort of just flaking out the server under test because well, it's not very good. By the way, one of the common problems that I see, um, and it, it happens on the, the mailing list, you'll see it. People go, the Firefox driver hangs. And you go, it doesn't work. And it's like, oh, I'm pretty sure it does. Like, I've got an extensive suite of tests that verify that this thing functions. Um, and what tends to happen is, for some inexplicable reason, people during tests will leave the analytics bugs in. And analytics servers take a long time to respond sometimes. Um, you see it with ad servers as well. Sometimes ad servers sort of take a long time. And we're pretty conservative with how we detect that a page is loaded. If it's possible and you really want a fast test run, then 
um, either hide your ads and your analytics stuff behind a test flag so that you don't see it when you're doing the tests, um, or put in a proxy or something like that to make sure that, that those aren't the things that are constraining the speed of your tests, because you do see that quite often. Hello. Hello. Um, this is Maria from NERSOF. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I would like to know uh, how do you handle test cleanup when running in the cloud? Uh, for example, I have a, a, some tests that runs uh, sequently, and they clean up uh, after the finish. So how, how can we handle this when going into the cloud? OK. Um, so there's a number of ways you can do that. I always like to think of like testing at different scales, right? So there's testing that you do against the local host. And you know, in that case, you're going to start up a local database. You'll start up a local server. Um, if you need a message queue, you'll start up a mess local message queue. You'll start up the browser locally. And everything will be running on the same box, right? And when that happens, um, test cleanup is like, OK, well, if I want to verify that the, the virtual machine is back in a clean state, I'll just dispose of the virtual machine and start a new one. Um, and that's cool. And ditto with the databases. The second level of testing, though, is where you're sort of putting the application under test into an integration environment or onto your production environment. And at that point, test uh, data brittleness starts hurting. Like when you're testing against your local machine, if you want to have a piece of data, well, you just create it and shove it in the database, right? That's not a problem. By the time you get out to production, if you're creating data and shoving it into the database, you've probably got a security risk there. Um, if you're working for a bank, you probably can just stop working now, because you'll have creamed off the, the, the profit. Um, so one of the things that I, I like to talk about, and that, to be honest, I never do, because I'm a lazy soul, um, is in a local environment, uh, assert, asserting the shape of data in a local environment creates that data. And then by the time you hit production, you can assert the shape of the data that you need for your test. and then that assertion will go and find you the matching accounts that, or the, the matching stuff that, that hits what you need, and then you can reuse that stuff. Um, but you never really see people asserting the shape of data. They just either assume it's there or, or that it's not there. I don't know if that helps. Um, there was a question at the back. No, we're, we're in the front now. Oh, we're in the front. Uh, Simon, so a question on... Um generation of page objects using the page yep. factory. Have any Selenium WebDriver users successfully uh, created like a scraping tool where you can point to a URL, it will scrape all the UI elements, create page objects using uh, the factory you guys provide? Does anybody or do you know of anyone who's created that so we can leverage that? Uh, and by leverage, you mean use, yeah? There you go, yeah. It's just technically a correct word. Leverage or use, yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, so at Selenium conference last year, there was someone who presented a Ruby tool that did this. Um, you know, you pointed at a page and went, hey, and generated like a gajillion things for you. Um, I don't like that. So one of the things is sort of people look at a page object and they go, that represents the entire page, right? Um, and then they probably use inheritance to go, this page is like the base page, and then this page is like the base page, but it's got this on. And, and this page is like that page, but it's a little bit different. And you end up with these really deep inheritance trees. Um, and then they go, this page down at the bottom is just like that page all the way up, except it doesn't have the left-hand nav. You're going, oh, this isn't good. Um, so how do you avoid that problem? And the way you avoid that problem is you stop thinking of the page as a cohesive whole. Um, how many of you are, have heard of a browser called Internet Explorer? <laughs> yeah, most of you. Um, so Internet Explorer isn't actually a browser. It's a collection of COM objects that are sort of bolted together that give the appearance of a web browser, right? Your pages on your website. OK. OK, guys, I'm sorry. Oh, that was unexpected. Was that, was that planned?